Welcome to the Houdini Hulai Challenge series. So, side effects is holding a 31 day challenge where artists create a piece per day based on a daily topic. I've decided to take on the challenge and record each day's work so that you can see the process. I'm doing this so that I can challenge myself and I'd recommend that you do the same. So, let's get straight into it. Hey guys, welcome back to another makeup tutorial. Today is day 10. Over here, oh, that's a thick one. A 10 slow mo. So, the idea for this one is those time creatures from Legion. I don't know if you've watched Legion, it's a very weird show, but clearly I must enjoy it because I've watched all three seasons already. Uh, but anyway, there's these weird time creatures in there that sort of click. Um, I don't know how else to, to explain it, but their movement is based on clicks. So they'll click from one position to another. And it's almost like they're caught in time when they click to that new position. So there's no in-between movement. They're here, then they're there, then they're there. And so their smoke simulation that they, they have also follows those same rules. So the smoke simulation is here, then it's there, then it's there. And so I thought that would be kind of cool. What happens if I had to make something that ticks as time progresses? But the simulation is also running at the same time. So that thing's movement is ticking, but the simulation is running in slow motion. So it's almost like there's two different time scales being run at the same time. So yeah, I'm going to give that a go. So what ended up happening, and this is after the fact, this is after I finished with the setup. What ended up happening is that the ticking didn't look good. I can show you. I, I really like the setup for it though. Um, I'd like to use it for something else, but it's not, it's not working for this. So I'll show you. You just plug any geometry that has some sort of animation on it into a solver. And what the solver does for you is it ticks the geometry. So if you play this back, it'll move at 48. Then again, every 24th frame, right? And that's pretty cool. I like the idea of it, um, but I, I didn't like it in execution. It it didn't feel right for this one. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the vellum setup because I actually want to show you the smoke thing. Smoke thing was cool. I like the smoke thing. So I time shifted to the first frame um, so that, you know, you don't have any residual animation. And actually, let me show you the box modeling for the uh, mask. It's it's pretty cool. I don't usually show you the, the geometry stuff, but this one's, this one's interesting. So there's a sphere, you make another sphere and mirror, that's for the eyes, and then you boolean. So you end up with this, right? I know, it looks it looks just like what you end up. And then you do a curve over here, this cuts out the chin area, right? So you end up with this. You then also make two incisions into the eyes with this boolean over here. So I believe this one over here is the nose, you just um, take a box, transform it, so that it ends up with that shape. Do a poly draw to split it over there, edit it into this orientation over here, so sort of like that nostril shape. Edit that, pull it down in the front, you boolean that into the face, end up with that. Then over here you have the, I guess, eyebrows. <laughs> I don't want to call it eyebrows, they're not really eyebrows. They're the, um, I guess, the eye bone shapes. So you draw a curve where you want them, you convert that to a polygon, poly extrude that down, poly extrude it forward, and then you can make some edits to it just to change the shape a bit. Mirror it so you have one on this side, you boolean that. So now you have an angry face, right? 
doesn't look very pleased. And then it needs kind of like a, a lip to the front. So what you do is you take this sphere up here, you boolean it so that you cut it in half like that. And then similar to the growth tutorial, you want to cut it in half so that you can only work on one side. It makes it easier. And then you can, you know, mirror it afterwards. Poly draw for retopo, then you mirror it. Then over on this side, these are the horns. You draw some curves, transform them up, convert them into a polygon and a poly wire. Um, you blast off the top, you mirror it over to this side. And the reason you blast off to the top is that when you polyfill, they get pulled back together. So do this, blast the area where the horns go in, you reconnect them, then polyfill. So that happens over there. And as you can see, you just use triangle fan as the full mode so that it joins to a point. And then it's basic just like sculpting and editing of this. Subdivided and UV flattened, add a mountain node for more interesting shapes. Because when you actually render, and this is a bit of a, a tip, you notice when things are too perfect. Even if you're doing a render that you want to look very clean and perfect, don't forget to add minor variation. And I say minor because this is a tiny variation, right? from going from this UV flatten to this mountain. But what happens is when you have light hit, you tend to pick up on those little bumps and imperfections and it really sells it. It, it makes the eye believe that, you know, this is, this is real. So you do all of that, you end up with a mask geo, cool. So yeah, then I take that mask over here. You do some animation to it, it's basic transforms. And then you plug it into this over here. You poly extrude this back. So I just make a group and then poly extrude them. It's the lining group and I use that again later. So you make a lining group, it's just based on that edge over there, extrude it back. Use the poly extrude side, so your output side, I use the output everything because I don't know which one it was, but it's you need side, and then you blast everything but side so that you have this. What you can do with that is you can remesh it, and then I transfer an attribute so that I know which points need to be anchored. You can see over here I have an anchored attribute, it's these points over here. You want those connected to the mask. So a bunch of transfers, basically what I'm also trying to figure out is a density. So you can see over here, this is density. And I use this to drive a scatter later on. You smooth the cloth a bit, you create a noise attribute, you apply the noise only towards the back, and then you scatter points towards the back. So you can see I have some points at the back that's based on density, and then I have some that are kind of just all over. You mix those two together so that you end up with more fractures at the back, and then a connect adjacent pieces. That gives you these nice curves, right? Um, in most cases, something like this would be useless. In this case, you use it for an edge fracture. So you edge fracture your cloth, and if you take a look at the exploded view, you end up with bigger pieces towards the front, smaller pieces towards the back because of that scatter. You put that into a vellum cloth right over here, vellum cloth. This is, I believe, I don't even think I changed anything on here. This is like straight out of the box, basic vellum cloth. So then you attach that. So what you need to do is you need to feed in the collision geometry. So you feed that in over here. And what it allows you to do is select that lining group. So you use attach to geometry, you choose your anchor points. So those are based on that anchored attribute. You connect them to lining, right? What that allows is for these points over here to stay stuck. They stay stuck to the mask as it moves. If you visualize the mask as well, you can see they stay connected. This vellum solver is also very simple. What I do is I just have very high winch drag and velocity damping and a very low time scale. Time scale of 0.05. I thought it was 0.2. Um, again, 0.05. And then inside I have a keyframed wind. So originally it's very high. Um, you can see I start at frame minus 25 because you don't want it to be in this orientation when it starts. You want it to already have been blasted a bit. So I can show you that quickly. If we set this to minus 25 as our minimum frame. Yeah, you can see it starts out like this, but I have this keyframed wind over here. So it has a very high pushback towards the Z axis and a very high noise amplitude. I keyframe that down. You can see it drops um, over here from like 50 to zero, or 50 to 10, sorry, so there's still some noise. Then what that allows is that this starts off at frame one with some noise, right? It's already broken up, which is cool. I try and stick these points back to the mask because they move out of place a bit. Um, basically, well in post-process, you end up with some very nice cloth, high res, uh, with a bit of thickness, that's all that I do for the cloth. Um, and then I shrink it down a bit. And this is actually to hide artifacts. You might not see it in the render. I think there is like a couple of frames. If you feel like going and checking it out, you can. But there's a couple of frames where this over here flickers. And I'll show you with the original. That's because I do this. You can see it. Yeah. So there'll be some 
You see that? That's snapping back and forth right over there. It snaps back and forth, back and forth. And I think there's also like another one down here that snaps or something. But what ends up happening is in that post process, it starts to look a bit bad and you can see that flickering. So what I do is I scale this down slightly. What that allows is I can hide it behind the mask because I already had the camera move and you I wanted this camera angle. So I just scaled it down. So it goes from this where you can actually see the problem to this where you can't. Merge that with the mask, you're sorted. And I thought I was done with the effect. I, I didn't really want to add anything else because I thought this was cool. But then I messed around with some smoke and I think you can see in the time lapse that I mess around with the smoke and it just doesn't work. I, I don't get it looking right. And so I render it overnight and I wake up in the morning and you know, I wake up like, ah, oh, what a lovely day. Get a glass of water, come to sit down at my desk, check my phone. Oh, what is this? A notification. It is load shedding. Stage two has now started. For those of you who don't know, load shedding is something that us South Africans invented very proudly. So when our power grid is under stress, so when there's too much usage on the power grid or when one of our coal stations blows up, which seems to be like every second day, and then what they have to do is they need to limit the amount of strain on the power grid by switching off your electricity from a certain time to a certain time. So a, a pre-scheduled time. And that's cool, you know, but um, most people don't know what the scheduled time is a lot of the time. Like it's, it sometimes just goes off and you don't know when it's coming back on. Your power goes off for like four hours and you just sit there and you don't know what to do. And it, it does that every day for like a month. But we're only in stage two, so that's fine. All right, it's, it's four hours a day of no power. And so I saw that we had load shedding later today. And so then I go and I decide, you know what? Before I even start on the squash and stretch one, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try and figure out the smoke thing. So before the power went out, I tried to figure out the smoke. And this is what I came up with. And I'm, I'm so proud of this, it's really cool. So originally I had that smoke system down at the bottom there. It didn't work. The thing is, I wanted smoke to pour out of the eyes. That would mean pre-running this, because when it starts at frame one, there already needs to be smoke. It also needs to be slow on the time scale, right? It needs to be a slow smoke, which means a long pre-run. So I, I figured it would probably be about a three hour, four hour simulation um, if I wanted like really good quality smoke. So I came up with an alternative. I bring in this geometry, I blast the area by the eyes. It's almost like a tear duct kind of thing. Scatter, point jitter, so I have some points. Give it a velocity so it shoots forward and out a bit and a bit down. Then you feed it into this pop net. This is cool because this pop net is fast, right? It's just a particle network. Okay, so it just emits some particles, pop wind, two pop winds, and a pop kill. Pop kill is just there to kill anything that goes behind the mask so that you don't end up with smoke falling behind the mask. Then this pop solver, I set the time scale to 0.2. Not, not too bad, right? This is like a five minute setup. So I take that out and I bring it here. So you can see what I end up with, right? This is a, it's just this, it's just a particle simulation, particles falling. But then what I do is I run it through my own little attribute wrangle. It checks each point, counts how many neighbors that point has. So it checks in like a radius. And depending on how many points it has, I adjust its density. So points that have a lot of neighbors are a higher density. Points that are out here. So like this stray one over here. Yeah, I'm looking at you, I see you. That one over there he'll have a density of zero because he has no neighbors. So then I also do a thing that as it ages, the density decreases. So you just do age divided by life. Those are two attributes that come out of the pop network. So you say age divided by life, that gives you a value between zero and one. When it's one, it's lived its full life expectancy. So then I take that and I multiply the density by one minus this, one minus this. <laughs> oh guys, I've been getting lazy with my naming conventions. It's kind of bad. This, this is dissipation. Um, I should have named it dissipation, but I'm, I'm getting really lazy these days. It's really bad. I just, I do setups like this and then I come back to it and I'm like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? Anyways, um, so it's dissipation. I do one minus dissipation because remember it's a value that is one when it's fully aged. So one minus dissipation times my density gives me this. It kind of follows the same rules as smoke, right? These all wispy bits over here because they have neighbors, they stay alive, but if it spreads out, it dies out. And so then I rasterize that and I smooth the smoke out. So you take that, and in this material network I can show you, it's so it's so straightforward. You just increase the scatter coefficient, super high, absorption coefficient, super high, 
So um, scatter coefficient is, I believe, like how visible the smoke is. Then this abs absorption coefficient is how opaque your smoke is. So that gives you very dense smoke. And we can take a look at that in the render view, All right? Super dense smoke. And this isn't even smoke. That's what's so cool. And I love it because it's a 15 minute simulation time. And not even. And you end up with what looks like smoke. And so then I just add this light down here, this RS light 2. This one has a high contribution, so it has a contribution scale of 1. That means that it can affect volumes. You can see there, as that increases, it gets affected more. One issue I had was that because the smoke was an afterthought, I had issues compositing. If you look closely, oh, and, and that's actually the other thing. You probably noticed that the smoke's red here. Um, originally, the setup was red. Um, I can show you the original render. Yeah, you can see the original render was red. Um, this was before I add the smoke, so I rendered the smoke separately. The The inspiration ended up being the Daredevil opening scene. That's a series you should watch. If you don't watch Legion, go watch Daredevil. Daredevil was sick. And Punisher was also cool. You should watch those too. But uh, the intro to Daredevil was really cool. It had this sort of thing where everything was red. It was red on red on red. And so you end up with, with this. This is before post-processing, so it looks a little bit um, low contrast, faded. Anyways, I went into my compositing network and over here, you can see I bring it in, and my separate smoke render over there. The issue, and I don't get why it does this, for some reason, when you mat, and I, it might be because I'm bad at compositing, I, I like compositing isn't really my thing, I don't understand why it mats and gives black instead of transparency. In my mind, this should be transparency. Actually, no, it makes a lot of sense. No, it shouldn't be transparency. I had an issue removing the, the black from the smoke, so I had to do some like weird luma key stuff and then composite adjust levels so that I could make a mask. Erode the mask, because if I don't do that, you end up seeing these weird like black lines around the edges, and it gets even worse if I don't do the the other erode over here, right? Do you see that? That like really hectic black line. So yeah, I had to do a bunch of dilates and erodes and things, but you end up with this, and then I realized I don't like the red. I don't want to be associated with Satan worship or anything. So I was like, let me let me not make it a, a devil-based effect. Let's rather do like a fallen warrior kind of thing. So HSV, that's just a U saturation value. Easy, U saturation and value, HSV. Reduce the saturation scale to zero. Then the redshift post effects I use a LUT. So what a LUT does is it takes the entire color range that you have. So I think it's I think it's generally based on lu luminosity, which is like whites versus grays versus blacks, and it applies colors depending on that. So you can see this completely changes if you use a different um, LUT. So I think like chemical is very crude something. Oh no, never mind. Um, I don't I don't know. McKinnon is um, from Peter McKinnon, I think. So yeah, and these I can't remember where I got them. I got them for free, so it's kind of cool. I just use these. You end up with this over here. Add some grain. This is something that you might not think to do, because why would you add grain to an image? And what it does is it actually makes your image look more realistic, because there is grain in an image. You don't want a perfectly clean image, so you add a uniform grain to it. It's different to noise, because grain is more like film grain. If you watch movies, they'll add film grain. Um, when something's too crisp, it looks off. It's also a good way to blend things together once you've comped them. So if you take a look over here, you can see that this on the left side, you have to look really close, um, has a different noise pattern to this on the right. With the grain, it has the same noise pattern. Now you might not think that that's noticeable, but it's it's actually kind of important. It's something that your eye picks up on, and you're like, why does this look weird? I just, I don't get it. Grain just helps it. It helps it a bit. So then, yeah, I'll put that, and you end up with this. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Tomorrow I'll be back with squash. With tomorrow I'll be back with squash and stretch. I don't actually know, you know what I'm doing for that one yet. Um, it's a bit of a weird topic. I, I don't like that one. I'm interested to see what other people do because I've got no idea. We're now also in hard mode because of load shedding, so that's great. But hey, what you gonna do? So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.